If you're anything like me, you sometimes like to search what happened to insert NBA bus name here. For instance, you might Google what happened to Greg Oden and find out he went back to school. Or you might search what happened to Adam Morrison and learn he's recently opened up a store that sells grooming products for men who have gross puberty mustaches. Or you might check in on Anthony Bennett and learn that he was cut from a team in Turkey. And yeah, one of those three things was fake. At least I hope so. Anyway, finding out information on bus is easy. But in today's video, we're doing something similar but different. Instead of looking at the worst the NBA draft has to offer, we're going to look at five players who were once seen as NBA All-Stars at least, but instead became average at best. So let's just start with number five, Michael Carter Williams. Headed into the 2013 NBA draft, no one knew what to make of Michael Carter Williams. As a six foot six point guard at Syracuse, Carter Williams had shown flashes of greatness and was named an honorable mention All-American as he led his team to the Elite Eight. It was in college where MCW had some scouts convinced that he was a future all-star due to his unique height and length at the point guard position, while other scouts, well, they thought he didn't have the athleticism or jump shot needed to succeed in the NBA. Fast forward to Michael Carter Williams' first game as a pro. Leading a Sixers team that would win just 19 games against a Heat team that featured LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, and Chris Bosh in their final season together, Michael somehow led Philly to a shocking upset win, and in the process, he put up an absurd stat line of 22 points, 12 assists, 7 rebounds, and 9 steals. Overnight, the hype for Carter Williams grew to future all-star levels, and his rookie season as a whole seemed to confirm this, as in 2000. 2014, he was named the Rookie of the Year after averaging around 17 points, 6 assists, and 6 rebounds a game. Which sounds very promising, but moving forward to the 2017 season, you can now find Michael averaging 6.6 .6 points, 2.5 assists, and 3.4 rebounds a game. That's a pretty big drop off, so we have to ask ourselves, what happened? Well for starters, his rookie season was the classic case of empty stats on a bad team. The 2014 Sixers were awful, so the team had no reason not to give Carter Williams complete freedom to do whatever he wanted on the court. This freedom allowed Michael to put up some great numbers, but the Sixers themselves were not fooled. They knew Carter Williams was not their future point guard, and so in just his second season, while his value was at its highest, Philadelphia traded him in a deal that sent Michael to the Bucks and brought back a Lakers first round pick that will be unprotected in the 2018 NBA draft. And in my opinion, this trade brings us to the second biggest reason as to why Michael failed as a pro. As we all know, basketball is a game that is all about confidence. You need to believe you are one of the best players in the world to succeed at the highest level, and after he was traded, it's clear that his team's lack of faith in him shook Michael's confidence. Then when he began to struggle as a buck, that confidence eventually dropped to an all-time low. So now, instead of the young star with a bright future we once saw, MC CW has become a below average bench player on the Charlotte Hornets, which makes him the absolute worst rookie of the year in recent NBA history. Number four, Johnny Flynn. When we look back at the 2009 NBA Draft, we remember that Minnesota chose two point guards, Johnny Flynn and Ricky Rubio, ahead of Steph Curry. Now, that was obviously a colossal mistake, one of the worst in NBA history, but what we forget is that there was a time where Johnny Flynn looked like he had a chance to develop into an NBA All-Star. When he was at Syracuse, Flynn took the nation by storm with his electrifying style of play. Though undersized, Johnny was able to use his speed to dominate the college game and was seen as one of the top prospects in the draft. This, of course, led to the Timberwolves drafting him with the sixth pick, and while now we of course know this was a mistake, at the time, the only real problem people had with this pick was that it seemed unlikely that Ricky Rubio and Johnny Flynn would be able to start together. And sure, eventually after their rookie seasons were over, Steph was seen as the better prospect, but again, Johnny was also seen as 
a very promising player. In 2010, Flynn averaged 13.5 points and 4.4 assists a game and had several moments as a rookie that had Minnesota fans very excited. During this single year, Johnny proved that even as a pro, he was still able to use his incredible quickness to his advantage and was able to put together complete games where he looked like a future all-star, such as the time he dropped 29 points and 9 assists against the Sixers, or the 22-point, 5-assist, 4-steal performance against the Nets. Looking back at this rookie year, it's obvious that if life was fair to Johnny Flynn, he very well could have been a borderline all-star or at least a starter-level player. But his life wasn't fair, as in the second-to-last game of his rookie year, tragedy struck. This game saw Johnny leave with a hip injury, and at the time, this just seemed like a minor setback for a future promising career. But after he underwent surgery in the summer, Johnny was never really the same player. This hip injury zapped him of the quickness that had defined his game. And now, playing without his ultimate advantage, Johnny Flynn became a certified NBA bust. In his second season, he put up just 5.3 points per game for a 17-win Minnesota team. And the year after that, when he was just 22 years old, Johnny Flynn was out of the league for good. And of course, it's impossible to see into the future of what Johnny's career could have been. But we have to wonder, how good would Johnny Flynn have become if his body had just held up? Number 3. Emeka Okafor when we look back at the 2004 college basketball season, one player stands out above everyone else. Yes, 2004 was the season of Emeka Okafor. As playing for UConn, Okafor destroyed everyone in his path on the way to a national championship victory. By the time the season was over, Emeka was named college basketball's player of the year and was seen by many as the top prospect in the 2004 draft class. But the Orlando Magic saw things differently. And so, with the first pick, they took a chance on a high school kid with a lot of upside, Dwight Howard, which meant Emeka went to the Charlotte Bobcats with the second pick. It was in Charlotte where in his first season, Emeka played so well that it looked like the Bobcats now had a future franchise player. In 2005, Okafor was named the NBA's Rookie of the Year after averaging 15.1 points, 10.9 rebounds, and 1.7 blocks a game. And remember, the NBA in 2005 wasn't like it is today. Back then, championship teams were still built on the backs of dominant big men, and Emeka was so impressive that popular sports writer Bill Simmons ranked him as the player with the 16th most trade value in the entire league. This was ahead of guys such as Carmelo Anthony, Chris Bosh, Pau Gasol, Paul Pierce, the list goes on and on. Unfortunately though, as we all know, Emeka never really lived up to this hype. The main reason for this was that like many of the big men throughout NBA history, Emeka's body was just not built for the wear and tear of an 82 game regular season. When he was in college, Okafor underwent back surgery, which should have been a huge red flag. And sure, when he was playing, Emeka was able to take the court in most of the games his teams played in, but these nagging back injuries were still affecting him. When he was in college, Okafor was able to use his unreal defensive IQ and solid athleticism to become a monster on the defensive end. In his final two seasons at UConn, he averaged 11.4 rebounds and 4.4 blocks a game. As a pro though, with injuries cutting into his athleticism, Emeka was never able to dominate the game like he had in college. Number 2. Eric Gordon now, I'll admit, Eric Gordon is a strange name on this list because he has had a pretty good NBA career thus far, especially in his last two seasons. I mean, last year he was the sixth man of the year, and this season he's averaging almost 23 points per game, which seems pretty great. But what you might not remember is that there was a time when Eric Gordon looked like he was going to become the best shooting guard in the NBA. As after he was selected 7th by the Clippers in the 2008 NBA Draft, Gordon quickly became one of basketball's most exciting young players. An absolute wrecking ball on the court. Eric was able to use his great strength and athleticism at the guard position to blow by defenders and challenge big men at the basket with ease. This unique set of skills at the two guard spot 
spot allowed him to rank 15th in the NBA in free throws per game in just his third season. And he was also able to put up a near all-star stat line of 22.3 points, 4.4 assists, and 1.3 steals per game. These third-year stats were certainly better than the third-year stats put up by future all-stars such as James Harden, Jimmy Butler, and Klay Thompson, which is the main reason why many people believed Eric Gordon would soon take the leap and become one of the NBA's best two guards. But that didn't happen. Unfortunately, the skills that made Eric so great, his ability to body defenders at the rim, would also be the skills that would ultimately lead to his downfall as a young player. At the end of the day, some players, such as James Harden, are able to take this contact night in and night out and still can play in 82 games. Other players, such as Gordon, begin to suffer injuries as all of these hits begin to add up. Which is why in his fourth season, after he was a key piece in the Clippers trade for Chris Paul, Eric suffered a serious knee injury. This injury would haunt him for years, as the once young future star who loved contact became a basketball player who was afraid to drive. By the 2016 season, despite averaging 33 minutes per game, Eric had gone from one of the top free throw shooters in the league to a man who averaged just 2.5 free throw attempts a game. And sure, at least in Houston, it does seem that Eric's career has had a revival of sorts, but it's still a shame that injuries cost us another young NBA star. And number one, Tyreek Evans. Throughout the entire history of the NBA, there have been only four players who have averaged 20 points, five rebounds, and five assists per game in their rookie season. Those four men are Oscar Robertson, LeBron James, Michael Jordan, and wait for it, Tyreek Evans. Yes, after a 2010 rookie season that saw Tyreek put together a historic campaign, the rest of his career has been less than memorable to say the least. Again, we have to ask ourselves, what happened here? How is it even possible that Tyreek Evans' best season as a pro was his rookie year? Well, like many players on this list, injuries certainly did not help. But in my opinion, that's not the main reason that Tyreek did not develop into a star. When looking at Tyreek's career, we have to look past his injuries and zero in on the team that drafted him. In the last decade, it's been clear that the Sacramento Kings have been a joke of an organization. Not only have they made mistakes, after mistake, but they've also proven to be a complete mess when it comes to player development. And if you're not convinced, let's just look at what the Kings did to Tyreek. As after Tyreek put up those awesome stats I mentioned and won the Rookie of the Year while playing point guard, Sacramento decided for some reason that they could not win with Tyreek Evans at the one. So they started to play him at mainly shooting guard and sometimes at small forward. That's the reason why Tyreek's best season as a pro was his rookie year. The man was meant to be a 6'5 NBA point guard. That was the position that was able to take advantage of his strengths while minimizing his weaknesses. As a basketball player, Tyreek is not an incredible athlete, and his jump shot has proven to be subpar at best. But when he was matched up against smaller point guards, that didn't matter as much. At the one, Tyreek was able to bully his defenders with his strong frame and could use his his 6 foot 11 wingspan to gain an advantage whenever he drove. Playing point guard also helped to hide his inability to shoot, as he was rarely forced to spot up and instead was given the opportunity to control the offense. Unfortunately though, the Kings clearly did not see what the future of the NBA was going to bring us, and so instead of trying to develop Tyreek as a tall point guard, Sacramento chose to make him a wing player, where he instantly became an average sized shooting guard who was not able to shoot. So sure, some are going to blame Tyreek Evans' below average career so far on his work ethic or his injury history, but I think we just have to wonder, what would Tyreek Evans' career look like if he was drafted by the right team? And that's all we have for today, guys. Thank you for watching. Before you go, though, I do have some exciting news. A new what if is coming soon! Yup, right now I'm working on what if LeBron James went to college. And I think the release date is going to be the day after Thanksgiving, so so get hyped! And that means if you are new to this channel, make sure to subscribe because we are doing what ifs. We're looking at NBA history. We do NBA conspiracies. Basically, if you love basketball, you will love this channel. I can guarantee that. And if you're already subscribed, you're awesome. We all know this. And as always, have an awesome day. And cue the music.